to start us off this afternoon, um, we've got Emma, who's going to come and talk to us about the interplay between um, children's social services and housing policy. And this again is something that I think is our, our kind of nuances, our gut instincts is that there's like a problem here and we're not quite sure how they interact together and what causes what and which way around it is. So Emma is um, being curious about that. And I think the aim today is to start that conversation <laughs> and open up maybe more ways of exploring what may or may not be happening. So, um, Emma, would you like to come up? Uh, that's a physics thing, isn't it? All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased today among some really wonderful people today. Um, so um, I wanted to talk to you about a piece of research that we did some time ago, but also the findings that I'll be drawing upon um, have come up in a number of subsequent pieces of research. So I work at the Centre for Regional, Regional Economic and Social Research, um, and we do lots of bits of research around housing interventions, health interventions, much of them relating to homelessness and in particular um, gendered um, uh, understandings of homelessness. So the piece of research that I'm going to talk about is was called Motherhood and Homelessness. Um, it took place a few years ago. Um, it involved 20, a, number, a, num a number more women in, in those settings, but there were 26 mothers who either had children with them or had been separated from them for a number of reasons. So <clears throat> there's a bit of an overview here, but I think everything here speaks to things that have already come up throughout today. Um, so the specific location of this research was domestic abuse refuges and temporary accommodation. Um, I'm going to be talking about family separation, um, both voluntary and involuntary. Um, I'll be talking about the intersection, um, as Laura just indicated, between domestic abuse, homelessness and children's social services in particular, and the kind of tricky, messy situations that you get with all those, those intersecting policies and guidances. Um, part of that will be thinking a bit about how some, somebody who is at risk might be framed as somebody who is a risk, where neglect is uh, needed, misunderstood for neglect. Um, and then hopefully uh, ending on a little bit more of a positive note, just thinking about some of the different services that are going to be tack that tackle trauma. And we'll be hearing from a number of uh, other people uh, today about that. Um, I wanted to just start by uh, reading you a few quotes from some of our participants. Um, now, all of these quotes are from mothers who felt that they had been separated from their children due to homelessness. Um, they were all experiencing domestic abuse um, and all of them felt that their separation from their families could have been prevented. So we had Maggie uh, describing how uh, through the situation of domestic violence, she had placed her daughter with her grandma for their own safety. Um, we had Sandra who was talking about um, having a child temporarily in foster care she wanted to be reunited with him, but when she was then deemed to be a single parent, she wasn't entitled to have that accommodation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what the policy actually states uh, further on. And then we had Emma, who was only entitled to a one bedroom flat. She was gonna to have to try and convince the court to allow her to sleep on the sofa whilst the children uh, use the bedroom, but then already you're alerting children's social services to a problem, and that's probably not going to happen. So all of those mothers felt that their situations of separation were becoming more permanent beyond their control. Um, Harriet, um, I interviewed in a domestic abuse refuge. She had a really complicated situation, um, didn't need to be as complicated as it was. Um, she had a, a child with a previous relationship um, and a baby whose father was incredibly violent. Um, when she ended the relationship, the father continued to threaten violence. Social services were, of course, very worried about the child and arranged for her to be moved out of area. Um, that then obviously uh, created a massive problem for Harriet's oldest child, who wouldn't be able to get to school easily, would have to leave his friendships. And that child didn't want to live in the refuge. 
because, you know, why, why would they? So um, he stayed with his grandma. Um, she was told that if she went back to the area where her, her oldest child was, she would have her child removed because she would be putting her baby at risk. So incredibly difficult situation. Um, feeling like she was breaking the law by, you know, going to do the school run um, across areas. It was really complicated. And I'm not going to go into it, but the added complexity is obviously um, the criminal justice system and non-molestation orders. Both parties have to have a copy of the order. It, it's incredibly uh, tricky. So I'm not going to go into that, but that's the extra layer. Um, so Harriet had a homelessness application in. The housing department offered temporary accommodation um, in her city of origin where she'd been moved away from. And she was told if she didn't accept this, she would be making herself intentionally homeless. Now, that should have changed since the Domestic Abuse Act, really, because uh, a victim and their child should be given priority um, and reasonable preference. But the intention in being intentionally homeless that clause can still operate and still does. And I've been doing re interviews in recent weeks where this, this has come up. Um, also, she was told that she had to make 10 weeks of payments in her order to be eligible for bidding. So really pleased to see Mel and Catherine's research taking such a forensic look, of, uh, look at this problem and trying to identify the scale because it is happening so frequently to people who are incredibly vulnerable. Um, so here you see housing need being interpreted as neglect. Um, so in these cases, in our research, we spoke to a number of mothers who had been made to feel by children's social services that they hadn't done enough to protect their child and that they had allowed their child to witness violence. And at that point, they, the child intervention comes in. Um, now, you know, it goes without saying that obviously these situations are incredibly complex and there's a lot of stuff going on. But fundamentally, what was clear from all of these cases that was that housing hadn't been picked up. So when, at the point that children's social services became involved, housing departments weren't involved. Um, and that, that issue just wasn't being dealt with. Um, so just I've got a few quotes here. Um, Kelly said, you know, he wouldn't leave my house. I couldn't leave my little girl in that house. He wouldn't leave. There was nowhere, nowhere for us to go. So we had to go back there. So the, you know, the material circumstances, the, the lack of housing often forces people to go back to their abusive relationships. Um, you know, Nicola was saying they could have done something sooner for me and they could have moved me to a refuge and I would have still had my kids with me. Um, and Alana talked about having her daughter adopted. Um, and she said, you know, couldn't you have found somewhere for me and my daughter? And that wasn't the case. Um, and, uh, and Maggie similarly said, it's a stage where I could get taken to court and lose her altogether, um, but I've not got a house to take her to. So all of these women felt completely powerless. So it's important just to reiterate that this research was done in 2018, 2019, which was before the domestic abuse act came in. But like I say, from research that I'm doing at the moment and some other research projects that myself and my colleagues have done, um, I should say, I didn't put their names on the slide. Kezia Reeve directed this project. Um, and so myself and Kezia and Sadie Parr, um, they've been doing a lot of work with research in practice to produce practice guidance for uh, social services. Um, and they're, I think some of those are freely available. So that's something to, to look at. Um, so much of this is about the fuzzy area between different legislations. So you've got your homelessness housing legislation, and then you've got the guidance that sits around it, and then you have a gray space. You've also got the legislation, the statutory legislation that children's social services are working towards in their jobs, and it doesn't connect with housing. Then you've got domestic abuse, which is a different process to housing, it's, and it becomes very complicated. Um, it, it depends on very much on asking the right questions. So, so many of the women we spoke to, when you actually discussed their interactions with housing and children's social care, the, the right questions, the glaringly obvious questions, just so many cases just didn't seem to be asked. And there were some really sort of simple fundamental things that, that weren't being um, dealt with. 
You've also, of course, got uh, departments working in incredibly difficult circumstances in terms of staff resource, in terms of just fundamental shortage of housing. So you've got individuals trying to do the best they can within enormous limitations. So we you know, fully appreciate that that's the case. Um, it also means that you've got individuals enacting guidance and policy, which means that um, you know, well, lots of local authorities will say that we don't do intentionality, we don't apply intentional, intentional homeless to especially people uh, experiencing domestic abuse. But we know for a fact that that does happen still in lots of areas. And often it might be down to, the, to individuals. It's not necessarily, might not be known, or it might be known um, that it's happening more than it is. Um, intentionality, when someone is understood to have made themselves intentionally homeless, uh, can happen when somebody has fled their previous property. So when they've absconded a tenancy, where they've got rent arrears that were due to their abusive partner, that can make you intentionally homeless. Um, and I spoke to someone just the other week about how that, how these things are being applied and they, it was a domestic abuse support provider, they, um, in their experience, see it being applied to people with very complex support needs um, more than others. So I think there's, there's an issue there around um, people needing support, having these particularly punitive practices um, applied to them and then what that does to them later on. Um, just a quick one on the policy around the code of guidance. So there is a code of guidance and, the, and it does state that if somebody presents as homeless who doesn't have their children with them, they should have their full family circumstances investigated. And so if they have children who aren't with them, that should be taken into account. But the problem there for local authorities is that that requires the housing department and children's social services to work together. And when all of those individuals have got such high caseloads, when they're so busy, when family circumstances change, they're so fluid, um, when domestic abuse situations change and they're so fluid, it makes making these decisions practically quite difficult. So I think that probably is a significant factor in, um, in instances where women don't have their full needs fully assessed. Um, it obviously needs to be addressed, but I think you know, that goes some way to sort of explain what's happening. Um, so I think in all of this, it's clear that for a lot of people, they feel that they're in a catch-22 situation. Um, and I wanted to just talk a bit about Roxanne and the quote up there. She approached her local authority to help. She had a really difficult case. Um, and herself and her partner had had a really, really difficult background. They'd both had a bit of a rocky time, um, but her partner was um, undergoing drug treatment support, so he was um, doing courses and tests. They weren't drinking, they weren't using substances, but even after they passed, passed the tests and social services um, and the orders were, were sort of spent, they still weren't allowed to have their children back because they were in a hostel. And this was incredibly upsetting because they had really jumped through all of the hoops. They demonstrated that they were doing everything that they were required to do. And they still felt that they were about to be permanently separated because they were in a hostel. Now, Roxanne had the energy to go to her local MP and advocate for herself. And that local MP went straight down to the town hall um, and basically kicked up an enormous fuss. And this case was reviewed um, by the leader of the housing department. Um, so in that instance, um, Roxanne and her partner and her children were able to get temporary accommodation for their family to reside together. But if she hadn't have had the energy, um, if there'd been any other barriers like language, um, she, they, they wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, and there were a number of other cases, really, really, um, really sad cases where people, you know, they didn't have that energy or support to advocate for themselves or anyone to advocate for them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's in summary, it is a really sort of brutal combination of, uh, of factors, um, all of which can be addressed. Um, and... The, 
in terms of housing policy and practice and rules and conditions, I'll talk about that in a minute. There's the bit about giving people access to housing and then there's a bit about what goes on in temporary accommodation and the rules and conditions that can undermine parenting practice. So I'll come on to that in a minute. You've got all of the issues around arrears, banning, and you know, there's sort of really important research coming out to highlight that that is a problem. Um, and uh, out of area placements as well. But sorry, there's a lot going on here. It was quite a, an intense, <laughs> involved piece of research. So I'm trying to do a bit of a, a skim through. Um, right, so it, it goes without saying that the refuges and temporary accommodation settings where we did our interviews are incredibly important, vital spaces for uh, the women we spoke to to seek safety. Um, it shouldn't have been, it shouldn't have got to that point. Um, ideally, they would have been able to stay in their own in their own homes and not move at all, but that is very difficult. Um, by necessity, refuges and temporary accommodation do have to have policies, have rules and ways of working to try and uh, maintain people's safety. Um, especially when it involves um, domestic abuse. But the very uh, being that those rules create um, massive problems for parenting. So feelings of isolation and entrapment that felt similar to being in the abusive relationship that people had fled from. That was something that came up a lot in our interviews. Um, being restricted to one room, uh, the children especially are often restricted to bedrooms, not able to... Uh, be in the communal spaces. Um, there may be good reasons for that because there might be people in those places who are struggling with mental health and are struggling with substance use at that time. Um, it's not an ideal situation. Um, uh, Non-resident children are subject to really restrictive visitor rules. Um, that was really painful for parents who you know, wanted their non-resident children to, to visit them. Um, and we've got Sandra there just saying it would be just so nice to sit in a garden where it's sunny, where the kids can run around. But actually, you know, they were really restricted to, to sort of rooms. Um, we have parents talking about feeling judged by social services for their parenting abilities, you know, not cooking for their children. Well, they didn't want to cook in those shared kitchens because they were kind of messy, scary places and the food was being nicked and they felt that that was a negative mark when Children's Social Services came to visit. Um, and we even heard from some people uh, who talked about there being chores and requirements for getting involved in looking after the building, um, which was another level of sort of micro-governing, which made uh, those mothers feel really under scrutiny. Um, there was, of course, dependence on food, ba food banks and food parcels and donations. Um, and those not being at all appropriate for sort of cultural or dietary requirements, that was a massive issue. Um, and just thinking about Jen's presentation before, there was a massive lack of support available for mental health, but particularly post-child removal. The number of mothers we spoke to who said that there was absolutely nothing in place for them after they'd had the child removed. Now it might be that there was something offered, but it was just not appropriate or it felt punitive and they'd been stigmatised by every service they'd come into contact with, so why would they want to? And the work that Jen and her team are doing to sort of break down those barriers is just so important. And I just wanted to finish on just a couple of examples of doing things differently. And we're going to hear more from uh, Jane and others after this. Um, there's so many services who are fully aware of these challenges of the trauma that women are facing and the way that services can reinforce that trauma. Um, Changing Futures um, has just re has received a, a big lottery grant for a housing project for um, families at risk of homelessness and child separation. So that will be mainly women who have had multiple child children removed and who have a, a range of intersecting support needs. So There's gonna be family accommodation to support them and their families. So that's going to be a really interesting project and it involves clinical psych psychology support as part of that. Um, I can't not plug my colleague Lindsay's research. She's doing an amazing piece of work around trauma-informed approaches in homelessness practice. So we, we all know trauma-informed approaches. We've heard that term, it's been around for years, but what does it actually mean in practice and how are providers 
enacting that, given the physical constraints of often Victorian institutional buildings and um, how are they doing it on the ground. So Lindsay's report there is really brilliant in sort of shedding light on that. Um, there's uh, obviously a change in the way that domestic abuse provision is being provided. So there's um, an increase in dispersed accommodation. Um, that, although that does bring some of its own challenges, and that's something I'm looking at at the moment. Um, and also the co-location of um, independent domestic violence um, advisors in housing settings is really important because that is sort of bringing that empathy and understanding and connection to sort of relevant services at that very um, initial sort of stage. So that co-location of workers um, is really helping to sort of break down some of those barriers. Um, and yeah, I'll stop now because we're going to hear more from some of those amazing providers who are doing things differently. Um, but yeah, thank you very much.